Let's turn to Luke chapter 24 and open with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you, Father, as we look into your word. Lord, that we not be familiar with your word, but that we approach your word in humility, knowing, knowing this, that we do not know anything as we should, but that your Holy Spirit continually reveals your heart to us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm going to read from Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. Luke 24, 1 through 12. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they, stood, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and they returned from the sepulcher, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And the words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And last week we talked a bit about resurrection. And today I'm just going to touch on a few points of why resurrection is so important. And as I was studying a bit from this, I, I came upon a writing of American history of June 6, 1944 was D-Day what we call DD, and I'm sure if everyone has heard of this. It's when the Allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy, France, to deliver Europe from the clutches of Nazi Germany. And this was said to be the beginning of the winning of the war, or the beginning of the loss of the war for Nazi Germany. And by spring, because of this huge, one of the biggest battles in human history, this event freed the world from Nazi Germany. And today we celebrate, today is what we celebrate as our D-Day. This is the day, this is the event, Easter, Resurrection Day, that the resurrection of Jesus has freed the world from the clutches of sin. And last week we talked about how easy it is to believe Jesus died for my sins. Jesus was crucified for my sins. Jesus was buried for my sins and Jesus rose for my sins. But it's more personal than that, in that the Bible teaches that I was crucified with Christ. Know ye not that our old man is crucified with Christ. It becomes a very personal event. I am crucified with Christ. The Apostle Paul says that I may know him, the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of of his resurrection my sin was buried with him and I was raised 
with him. Is that the same thing? No, really not at all. It becomes a very personal salvation to us. And the resurrection is the hub to which everything in our Christian lives turn. Everything in the gospel is tied to this. The resurrection is the very heart of it. And sometimes we really forget the true excitement of Easter because it has become Easter bunnies and baskets and eggs. And it's interesting, I saw the, a post the other day where somebody said, and I guess they were trying to be funny, is they said, the Easter bunny is a boy and boy rabbits don't lay eggs. And somebody posted, well, girl rabbits don't lay eggs either. <laughs> but the deliverance that we have in this, the resurrection, and it's been challenged time and time again and has stood the test of time for 2,000 years. History gives us ev evidence. Josephus, if you read the writings of Josephus. But we know personally as we read the word and we see what cowards the disciples were at the crucifixion and how these cowardly men became empowered because of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit was given. And they were empowered to carry the gospel to a lost world. Now I read a writing the other day written by a guy that I went to Bible college with 40-something years ago. And I really have not been in touch with him, but he posted, a, he had a posting that he posted, and it really ministered to me. And I, I, being a pastor, I was tempted to plagiarize it some and try to use it, and then I thought, no, you know what I need to do? I just need to read what he wrote and share it with the body. And I'm going to read that for you this morning because it really ministered to me, and I hope it will minister to you also. And he wrote, As we observe the death and the resurrection of our Lord, in remembering the Last Supper, we are once again chilled by the cold-blooded ruthless, ruthlessness of Judas' kiss of betrayal and cruel exchange of the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. After being with Jesus as he healed the sick, raised the dead, fed the multitudes, and shared in food and fellowship, how could Judas be so heartless, so void of reason and sanity? But there are many recorded tragic trades in Scripture. Eve questioned God's immutable and supreme goodness, disobeyed his elementary instructions, traded her daily personal communion and conversation with God for her idyllic setting in the Garden of Eden and all the paradisical features of those who followed her in life. Lot chose to raise his family in a city whose remembrance is still known for its notorious evil and wickedness and destruction by God. His choice of location caused the destruction of his wife, ruined the character of his daughters, causing the birth of his grandsons and their descendants who became hostile enemies of Israel. The ten spies were fearful and unbelieving, forgetting God's never failing faithful provisions and protection of them. They refused to go into the land of Canaan, causing the Israelites to wander 40 years in the wilderness instead of claiming God's promised victories over their enemies in possession of a land filled with milk and honey. Samson was given a special anointing and strength by God for the purpose of protecting and judging the people of Israel. He yielded to his fleshly desires and enticements of a heathen and enemy woman who betrayed him and caused him to be condemned to a life of humiliating slavery and sightless captivity. An enemy of Israel, Balak conspired with the prophet Balaam to give Balaam a prestigious position in exchange for cursing Israel. Balaam was warned and prevented of this contemptible act. 
But he determined to claim this irresistible offer hatched an abominable plot that caused the moral and spiritual fall of Israel by causing them to yield to alluring invitations from their enemy. To participate in heathen carnivals, Balaam achieved his supremely selfish and carnal goals, but his success caused his death when Israel later conquered these same enemies. The Pharisees chose their own empty, meaningly rituals, meaningless rituals, their jealousy, in exchange for the one who had come to fulfill all the prophecies on which they had clung and, and to and embraced. Prophecies providing their hope and promise of deliverance and salvation. Their Savior was physically there teaching daily and healing, but their blindness and hatred prevented them from prevented their humble acknowledgement of his presence. But just as there are those whose trades ended in tragedy, Scripture also tells us of those that were transformational. Moses traded his privileged, pallid life for suffering the afflictions of captivity with his people and obeying God's call to lead them out of Egypt. Rahab traded her past of ill, Ill repute for one of faith and biblical fame. She became the mother of Boaz and an ancestor of Jesus. Ruth traded her heathen gods for the one true God of Israel, married the good and godly Boaz, and became King David's grandmother. Mary Magdalene, after being delivered of seven demons, lived a life of loyal and consistent devotion to Jesus. And she was one of the last at the cross, cross, first at the empty grave, and first to announce his resurrection. Peter, James, and John left their boats, nets, and temporal pursuits to follow Jesus. They became Jesus' closest friends, his inner circle, perhaps to prepare them for the leadership roles they would serve in the early church. Jesus' teachings were rooted deeply within these three fishers of men. Zacchaeus gave up his greedy, cheating, money-hungry ways, restored fourfold to all he had stolen from, and became a biblical model of goodness and generosity. Saul of Tarsus traded his prestigious Jewish leadership position and gave up his persecution of Christians to become one of them. His life in Apostle required much sacrifice and even prison at time, times. The Apostle Paul was the first to establish the church among the Gentiles. Just as those, just as those of another time and place made their choices, we will also make our own. There is a power in his name. I choose Jesus. And I think of that song that Chris and, and the boys sing, Give me Jesus, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. So in looking at these teachings on the resurrection this morning, I just wanted to share, very briefly, share three truths of the resurrection. And the first of these truths that I wanted to share is that the resurrection of Jesus, it proves the deity of Christ. You see, without the resurrection, Jesus would be no more than Muhammad or Buddha or any other world religion. And as I've shared the gospel with people who were of different world religions, and the one thing that I can always say, that I can always tell them of, our salvation as opposed to their beliefs and whether it be a Muslim or of any of the other world religions is that they have a code that they live by of good moral behavior typically and as they believe as the Hindus believe that as as I was at a funeral and this Hindu Pandit shared, he said, life is like getting your driver's license, that if you do well, then you receive 
your driver's license. But if you do not do well, then you go back and you study and you work some more and you come back and try again. Meaning that we would be reincarnated until we reach the stage of perfection. But the Bible teaches us that there is none that does good. No, not one. And only by this free gift of salvation is there any hope for mankind. The resurrection is such a difference in that God himself, God himself provided the sacrifice just as the sacrifice was provided on the mountain when Abraham was about to sacrifice his only son. That God himself, he provided himself as a sacrifice. You see, the graves of all these famous religious leaders are still full. But the women went and found the empty tomb. It proves the deity of Christ. The second is that it provides, the resurrection provides a way of salvation. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 9, 19. For Christ died for your sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, by the spirit. And Romans 4, 25, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised for our justification. The power of his resurrection, that I am in Christ. My positional truth is that I was crucified, my old man, was crucified with Christ. And now I am raised with him, seated above in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We know that this is a very personal thing, that I am crucified with Christ. And each and every one of us can claim it as a personal truth. The third thing I want us to see in this this morning is that it previews the future. In Matthew 27, in Acts 1, an angel said, Why seek you the living among the dead? Why stand you here? Jesus' resurrection is a demonstration of his second coming. In John 11, Jesus spoke resurrection to Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. We see the power of the resurrection. Up from the grave. Remember that hymn that we sing. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He is alive today. It gives us a preview of what we can expect at his return. We have not talked about all that the resurrection does this morning. But time would not permit for us to cover everything about the resurrection. But it is the basis of our salvation. It lets us know what we can expect in our future. It proves the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. The question this morning is, what will each and every one of us personally do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? As we looked at the choices people made, God has put forth a call that his will is not that any should perish, but he calls all to him. But we can be like Demas who forsook the Apostle Paul. 
that the cares of this life were more than what he was willing to give up. Or we can be like Moses who lived in royalty in the palace. But he said, I would rather suffer the afflictions with my people than the pleasures of sin for a season. And we see looking back that Moses is one that will be esteemed in the kingdom of God. Demas was mentioned in the Bible as the one who forsook the faith. The Lord says, I put before you, as speaking to Israel, I set before you life and death, blessing or cursing, and then always the exhortation, choose life. Choose life that you and your seed may live.